Hello. Um, my name's Rowan. For those of you who haven't met me, I thought I'd just give you a very quick, um, rapid introduction of where I've come from. So um, who remembers 1999? Handful of hands. Um, keep your hands up if you remember Prince and the New Power Generation. Yeah, not many. So 1999, um, I started a website called flathunt.co.nz. Um, it looked like that. I was very proud of it for some reason. Um, it was basically a site where you could um, advertise your, your, for flatmates. Um, and that went okay. About a year later, it got bought by um, a small auction site um, called Trade Me. And when I say small, it was about 10,000 members at that stage in early 2000. Um, and it was reasonably unimpressive. It looked like this. Um, you'll notice the space on the home page with bidding starting at $1. So dollar reserve options for banners on the home page at that point. We did a redesign and, and it was much better after that. <laughs> much, much, much better. Um, so yeah, the site grew reasonably quickly from there. Six years later, um, we sold that business for $750 million. Um, so that was a pretty exciting period, six years. Um, about a year later, I decided I needed something different. So I went and worked for a small accounting startup um, that was just getting going. Um, and yeah, again, another exciting time. So there was, um, there was an IPO when there were just a few of us. I noticed some familiar faces today. Um, and the, and you, know, you kind of know probably the rest of that story as well. So I worked there for about a year. And since then, I've been spreading my time across a few other early stage companies. Um, some of which are now also starting to get big themselves. So Vend in Auckland, uh, Timely in Dunedin, Revert also in Auckland, and Atomic here in Wellington. Um, so yeah, all of those companies keep me off the streets at the moment. But if we wind the clock back to about 2008, um, uh, I, I went to Webstock. So Webstock is on this week in Wellington. And there was a speaker there um, from Apple called Michael Lopp. Some of you may know him from Twitter as, um, as Rands. Um, and he gave a really great talk about the key to um, a successful product, a software product. And he said that um, any great team building a software product needs three people. Uh, they need a designer, they need a developer, and they need a dictator. Um, so I thought, I mean, I, that really resonated with me. I thought that was really, um, it was a really cool way of explaining it because I can design a little um, and I can code a bit. Um, that was sort of my background, but I'm not world class in either of those areas. But I was part of these teams that had, had kind of built these, these great products, and I realized that actually kind of the dictator role that he was talking about was more or less the role that I had filled. Um, and so it occurred to me there's lots of information about how to be a good designer. If you want to be a better designer, you can seek that out. And there's, lots of inf there's tons of information about how to be a better developer, um, especially online. Um, but there's almost no information at all about how to be a good dictator. Um, so that got me thinking, you know, what does it actually mean to be a good dictator? And I think the first thing, <laughs> the first thing we need to acknowledge is that um, dictatorship as a concept has some PR challenges. Um, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't have a great track record. Um, so, I mean, can anybody think of, of a good dictator? Maybe a more recent example. Fidel Castro. <laughs> Arguably. It's not the one that I had in mind. I mean, probably the most recent example I could think of um, was probably the dictator that Michael Lopp had in mind when he gave his talk. It's Steve Jobs. Um, and he's obviously by no means perfect. He has had some major character flaws, um, but did some things right that I think um, we can learn from, or at least those of us who aspire to be better dictators can learn from. Um, there's a lot more to this than I can cover in 15 minutes, um, and I want to make sure you get back to work. But four things that I want to try and cover off today. I'd like to talk about Stadler and Wardorf, about swimming, about the Apple One computer, and about Brett McKenzie. <laughs> so um, we'll, get in, we'll get to those. But before that, kind of um, the computer scientist in me has to start at number zero um, and start with the fundamentals. I think one of the most important decisions any good dictator or aspiring good, good di dictator can make is to choose the best thing to dictate. Um, and it's not immediately obvious how you choose that, but there's a, there's a great quote from Seth Godin which I think kind of points to the answer, which is, change gets made by people who care, who have authority, and who take responsibility. Um, so useful for all of you to think about, um, you know, what do you care about? Um, where do you have authority and what are you prepared to take responsibility for? Um, and just to clarify, I'll highlight the most important word in each of those three questions. Because it does actually matter what you want out of those things. You know, if you don't really care about retail, 
or you can't have affinity with retailers, then you're probably not going to um, be a good dictator within Vend. And likewise, if you think accounting's dumb, <laughs> zero is probably not the right place for you either. Um, so that, that does matter. You know, what you dictate um, is probably the most important decision. Um, so let's get to these four things. Um, I think the first and possibly most important one is that a good dictator thinks really carefully about the language that they use. And one word specifically, which all good dictators really need to steer very clear of, is they. Um, you know, my advice to any aspiring dictator is just eliminate that word from your vocabulary and from your team if you can arrange it. Um, because they is a disease which topples dictatorships. <laughs> um, it's really easy to call someone else a Muppet but it's important that you spend some time looking in the mirror before you do that, um, unlike these guys. So think about how you describe your colleagues. Um, think about the language you use. And think about how you describe the other teams in the organization that you're part of. Are they they's? Um, there's actually a version of they which is sort of thinly disguised and often not seen as they, which is the business. Um, this is very common in my experience amongst teams of designers and developers. So this is a variant of they, right? The business. And we talk about design and, and, and as designers and developers, we talk about the business as if it's something separate and normally something dumb or misguided. You know, if only the business were smarter, then our jobs as designers and developers would be easier. If only the business didn't ask us to do dumb things. Um, but actually, as a dictator, the word you need to use instead is we, right? The business is you. You're part of the business. Um, and good dictators build a team. So let me start with a controversial example. <laughs> um, this, this guy is sadly one of my former heroes. But um, in, in professional cycling, they have, um, they have this great French word for um, people who make the team leader look good. Does anyone know what that is? Well, in his case, sadly, it was pharmacist. <laughs> but <laughs> that's not the word that I had in mind. Um, it's actually domestique. So they have this, this whole concept within cycling teams of domestiques. And their whole job is basically just to kill themselves in the early parts of the race um, so that they can set the team leader up for a good result. Um, and you know, Lance Armstrong, historically a winner, now a loser, but um, you know, pretty w widely recognized and well known. Um, but until the controversy around his doping scandal broke, hardly any of us would have heard of the other team members who supported him in those roles um, and you know certainly would have struggled to name them. Their names have now sort of become a bit more widely known as they've dobbed him in but uh, he wouldn't have won anything without them. He didn't win anything anyway but he wouldn't have won anything without them um, and actually in his case the, that includes the pharmacists. There's also this other myth which is very common which is kind of the, what I call the myth of the one man band um, and it's, it's partly a function of how stories about companies are told right so when you hear the story of Trade Me it's Sam's story, we hear the story of Zero, it's Rod's story, we hear the story of Vend, it's Fawn's story. Um, but actually it's very, very rare to find one person who's good at everything that a venture needs. Um, just like the Beatles were four, and they each had their own skills and, and specialties, um, so with any good product team, I think, and it's, um, it's important that you, that you um, don't fall into that myth of thinking that it's one, one person. Um, so another sporting example, um, you know, this, this um, Graham Henry, coach of the All Blacks, who's had great success, um, and he has this kind of slightly, sort of unnecessarily humble, kind of flippant way of talking about his success, which is that the key, he says the key to being a great coach is coaching the best players. And it's sort of, I don't know, if you, if you just look at it on the surface, it, it, it maybe seems kind of obvious, but if you think about it a bit more, I think it actually really highlights the importance, for good dictators at least, of surrounding yourself with winners. Um, and of course Steve Jobs did this too, right? So he, um, he's kind of the, the ultimate mythical one-man band, but actually surrounded himself with awesome people. Some of these are people now who have become more familiar in, in their own right, um, you know, post Steve Jobs. But um, he assembled this team, right? There's um, design and operations um, and, and manufacturing specialties within that. And he assembled this team and he got them all pointing in the, in the one direction. Which leads us nice, nicely, I guess, onto the second point, which is focus. So Tim Cook, who was one of those four, he's now the um, CEO of Apple, taken over from Steve Jobs, was interviewed after 
after um, Steve Jobs passed away and, and was asked, you know, what, from your time working with, with um, Steve, what was, the, what was the number one lesson that he taught you? And he said, well, the most important thing Steve taught us was that, um, you know, the key is to focus. And so there was this quite flippant response on Twitter, which I, which I loved from Chris Dixon, which was like, yeah, duh. Kind of as opposed to everybody who thinks that being unfocused is the key to success. Um, and of course he's right. I mean, we all know that focus is important and, and key, um, which made me think, you know, if we know this, then um, why don't we act that way? You know, if it's such a key ingredient for success, then why is it so uncommon to be focused? Um, and I think when you think about it, it's actually quite hard to define or describe focus. Like, what is, what is focus? What does it mean to be focused? Um, I found it quite hard to describe. It's kind of easier to think about what focus isn't, right? We kind of recognize that a bit more, a bit more easily. And so maybe the problem is just that we don't recognize when we're not focused. So for technical people, the first and foremost thing is um, to make sure you don't get bored, right? Because when you get bored, then um, lack of focus quickly follows. And I think this is much harder than maybe people realize because most technical people, um, present company included, are kind of drawn to complex and interesting things. Right? And so the way that manifests itself is in most cases, the things we work on, we start adding unnecessary shit to it just to make it a bit more interesting for ourselves, to make it a bit more challenging, just to keep, it, you know, keep us on our toes. It's really just we're getting bored and unfocused. Um, the second thing is don't flail. Flail is one of my favorite words in the English language. It's great, flail. Um, and uh, the best way I can describe flailing, or well, not flailing, is to talk about swimming. So I don't know if any of you are swimmers, but um, I would really thoroughly recommend anyone who aspires to be a good dictator learns to swim. And I'm not talking about you know, back and forth in a lane at Freiburg. I mean, in the sea, in the harbor. Um, because swimming actually teaches you a lot of important things about managing product teams. The most important of which is the, the importance of technique, right? method. So even the very best swimmers in the world are about 9% mechanically efficient, which means that every 100 calories they burn, about nine of those actually get used to push them forward. And all the others are, are wasted you know, with, with um, splashing and flailing. Um, and so yeah, I mean, when you, when you swim in the sea a long distance in open water with no line to follow, you quickly learn that it's really important to focus on your technique and stay relaxed. Um, and, and you know, really focus on what's actually pushing you forward um, rather than just focusing on splashing harder and faster because it doesn't actually get you there any faster. Uh, and, third and third and probably most importantly in terms of focus is learning to choose, right? So if you're anything like me, and I suspect most of you are, you've been brought up to believe that you can do anything. Like we've drummed this into kids from a very young age now. You can do anything. And I think it's an important message. Unfortunately, most of us interpret that to mean we can do everything, <laughs> which, is, which is not true at all, right? You have to choose. And focus means saying no. So think about, if you want to be a good dictator, what you're consciously saying no to in order to focus on the things that you want to say yes to. Um, to be a good focused dictator, I think the more that you can um, sort of align your satisfaction with actually shipping things, with actually, you know, um, getting things out the door the, and, and focusing on that, the more that, um, that your success will be correlated with the success of your venture. So the third thing is innovation, or more accurately, execution. Right? So innovation is something that we talk a lot about, aspire to. Um, in New Zealand we even have a government department named after it. Um, but very rarely do we talk about execution. Um, and I want to argue that actually execution is where good dictators should spend most of their energy. So this is a quote from Kevin Kelly, who is a great thinker. Uh, he was one of the original founding editors of Wired magazine. Um, and he says, sometimes the people who invent things and the people who find out what things are for are different people. So think about that. I mean, my advice, if you want to be a good dictator, is to focus on finding out what things are for. So let's just quickly summarize some of the things that Steve Jobs didn't invent. Um, he didn't invent desktop computers, definitely didn't invent the graphical user interface, did not invent computer animation, did not invent MP3 players, did not invent smartphones, did not invent tablet computers. Um, 
But he moved the state of the art forward in all of those areas, which is a pretty remarkable list, and that's probably why he's so highly regarded. Um, and so arguably, I reckon his genius was in discovering um, ways to make us desire all of those things. He worked out what they were for and made us want them. Um, so this is the problem about innovation versus execution, right? If you think innovation is hard, just wait. Um, the difference between those two, by the way, is innovation is, is, is normally all about one insight, one kind of new thing, new insight that kind of creates a new thought or area, whereas execution is about the exact opposite. Execution is about getting thousands and thousands and thousands of tiny little details right and piling them all up on top of each other. And so when you're a dictator, when you're a good dictator, um, your job is not just something that happens to you. Um, it's only something that has momentum because you start it rolling. Right, and so that's a pretty daunting thought. Um, and as an industry, we've kind of come up with a way recently of sort of um, getting past that, um, that the fear of, of that, that daunting thought, which is the idea of the MVP. Does anyone know what that means? The minimum viable product. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, I mean, basically summarized for those of you who may not have heard the expression, the idea is don't worry about making something insanely great, just ship anything, get it out the door. Um, so what is an MVP? Again, it's quite hard to define. Right? Is this an MVP? This is the original Apple iPhone from 2007. It's quite different from what we understand the functions of an iPhone to be now. It didn't have a lot of the things we take for granted, including apps. So it's pretty minimal in that sense. Obviously, it was successful. But is what we could call an MVP? Not really. I think unless you are as Apple was in 2007, unless you have the resources of that company, you're, you're never going to aspire to this kind of product as your minimal viable product. I think to really understand that, you need to wind it back to Apple when they were more like the sort of ventures that we work for, typically. Um, this is the original Apple computer, the Apple One, and it doesn't look much, does it? It's definitely a minimal viable product. Um, so obviously the definition of minimal of our product depends a lot on the resources that you have. And so if you're working for a small um, company, if you're working for a startup, often your definition of that needs to be reined in. Um, so my definition of a minimal viable product is even simpler than that. Um, it's anything that you can convince someone to use, uh, or even better, ideally, pay you money to use. Um, and so, I mean, that question of money is kind of an interesting thing. Most good, di good dictators, in my experience at least, are not especially motivated by money. Um, but it is a great way for a good dictator to keep score. Um, you know, if you pay attention to what people will pay you for, then that helps you very quickly narrow your focus in on the products you need to build. Um, so it's worth thinking about sales and marketing um, and the language you use to describe those teams. Like if you're a team of designers or a team of developers, how do you talk about the sales team in your organization? Are they they or are they we? I'm going to guess it's mostly they. Um, and if you're working for an even smaller company and you don't have a sales team, then look around because you are the sales team. Um, you know, if there is no other sales, if there's no one else responsible for sales, you are the salesperson. Um, so Paul Graham, who's the founder of Y Combinator in the US, has a great question which he asks the companies that he works with, with which I think gets to the nub of this question, which is how are you going to overcome your obscurity? You know, at the moment, no one knows you and no one's heard of you, and how are you going to change that? Um, so you know, if you want to be a good dictator, the question that should be front of mind is how are you going to market and sell the things you make? And last but not least, intersections. So Steve Jobs famously described Apple has been a company that exists at the intersection of technology and liberal arts. Um, and that was kind of a, a, a really nice expression of the strengths of the company, but also his own personal strengths, right? He had, he had skills in both of those areas. Um, which brings us to Brett McKenzie. Um, so you'll know him as a um, comedian from Flight of the Concords. Um, and a musician. This photo was actually taken the night that he won the Academy Award for Best Original Song. Um, but m most of you probably don't know him as a dancer, and yet I'm, it's not my area of expertise, but I'm reliably informed that what he's doing there is a near-perfect jeté, which is a dance move. 
It's kind of odd, right? So this photo was front page in newspapers around the world. It was kind of a picture of the Academy Awards that year that captured everybody's imagination. It's kind of odd that this comedian turned musician um, would be photographed dancing, but actually not. If you know a little bit more about him, his, his mother is actually a professional dancer. And so he grew up in her studio and was surrounded by dancers. And so it's kind of not surprising at all that he, he knows the odd move and can pull him out on the red carpet, which is even more impressive. Um, and there's a great segue to the story, actually, which is I heard him interviewed on Radio New Zealand the morning after he'd won the Academy Award. And the interviewer was kind of gushing and, and said, um, you know, so you've had great success with Flight of the Concords and now you've won an Academy Award. Like, you know, how do you follow that up? What are you going to do next? And just straight off the bat, he said, well, I've always wanted to be an all black. <laughs> yeah, who, doesn't, who doesn't want to be an all black, right? Um, so, you know, back, back to you, I think the important thing here for good dictators to think about is, is, is how they can be polymaths, how they can, you know, have skills in multiple areas. Um, if you're good at just one thing, that's probably not enough to be a good dictator. So think about the other things where you have um, some skills or authority. Think about the other things that you care about. It could be quite random things like dancing or comedy. Um, and think of those areas where you're prepared to take responsibility, like you know, where you're prepared to stand up. Um, because it's at the intersections of all of those things is where you're probably going to find the best opportunities for yourself to be a good dictator. So just to quickly summarize, um, focus on we, not they. I think good, good dictators, great dictators, are only as good as the team that they surround themselves with. Um, narrow your focus down and, and, and probably even narrower than you, than you think you need to to just those specific things that, that actually move you forward, that actually help you ship things. Um, think about what you can sell um, and how you're going to do that um, and especially make sure you're matching that to the resources that you actually have um, and work at the intersections of the various things that you're good at. Um, and if you do that I think there's no reason why you can't be a good dictator. So good luck with that. <laughs>